look, I have, I have two daughters, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I'm probably going to have conversations with them about, um, you know, information and disinformation, data permanence, privacy and security before I ever have the awkward conversation that a father never wants to have with a daughter about, you know, you know just don't talk to, to boys. We all know President Trump is a little different from past presidents. We've seen the tweets, we've heard the bluster, we've scrutinized the tanning bed circles around his eyes. But is the Trump presidency truly unprecedented? Today, I'll argue that it is, in fact, a whole new ballgame in three key ways, and none have to do with the mystery of Kofefe. Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer here in New York City, and welcome to your G Zero world. On the show this week, I sit down with Jared Cohen, founder of Google's tech incubator Jigsaw and a veteran foreign policy advisor despite being somewhat younger than me. And of course, I've got your puppet regime. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. I wanna talk with you for a moment about the Trump presidency. Uh, not the headlines, uh, but the big picture, the forest, if you will, and not the tweets. To what extent do we believe that President Trump is actually fundamentally different from all of the other presidents that come before? And, and I think he, he actually is, and in three specific ways. I wanna go through them for a moment now. First, authoritarianism. There's no question that President Trump has an authoritarian impulse, a lack of interest in the values and precepts that underpin liberal democracy. He likes the strong man much more than he likes the leaders of liberal democracies around the world. He probably wants to be one himself. That's different. Number two, corruption. Trump actually continues to own a multi-billion dollar corporation, the Trump Organization, with his name right on top of it. And he uses the office of the White House to promote that organization to enrich himself. Not just that, but members of his family, Ivanka, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, have ownership shares, and at the same time are serving in senior advisory roles in the White House. That's different than anything we've seen before. And number three, incompetence. President Trump has never had any policy role or any role that's engaged with policy historically, and his willingness to listen to experts who have that capability is extremely limited, more so than that of other presidents we've seen. I think in all three of these ways, President Trump is truly different from any president that has preceded him. But before we get ourselves unwound by all of this, let me say that of the three, I think only one of them really matters, and that's the incompetence. Why? Well, first, on authoritarianism. We like to talk about a deep state sometimes in the nether regions of the internet. That doesn't really exist in my view, but there is a deep bureaucracy. People that are more than willing to do their jobs and slow down a president if they think that he's acting in a way that would undermine American authority. So too, we have an independent judiciary that functions pretty well. We have free press. Trump may call them enemies of the people, but they still function, and he's not going to change that. The fact is that there are people around President Trump who used to support an authoritarian inclination as well. Most of them are gone. Think about Mike Flynn, the former national security advisor. Think about Steve Bannon, the chief strategist. Think about Seb Gorka, former senior advisor. In fact, I would argue the only person that remains in the administration around Trump who would still say, I want to get rid of checks and balances and make the strongest possible executive presidency is Stephen Miller. That's it. In the whole cabinet, quite something to say in terms of the inability of Trump to move his administration towards embracing authoritarianism. How about corruption? I absolutely grant that when we look at the conflicts of interest around Trump and his family, they are unprecedented in the United States. And yet, when we look around the world, we know what real corruption looks like. Look at Brazil and the Lava Jato scandal. It's brought down presidents and hundreds of ministers and legislatures across the country has taken tens of billions of dollars out of the Brazilian economy and has taken points of GDP off of South American and Central American countries. That's corruption. 
India, defense procurement, that's corruption. Russia, oil, gas, metals, that's corruption. Ivanka, getting a license to sell shoes and clothing in China so that the Chinese can have a better relationship with the Trump? Number one, it doesn't seem to work. But number two, that's tawdry. It's corrupt, it's not really done, it's embarrassing to us, but it's not strategic. And if you ask me, over the long term, four years or eight years of Trump, after he's gone, is the Trump organization going to be a sorry spectacle or something that really changes the way we think about the United States? I'd argue it's really just the former. No, it's the incompetence that's the only piece that concerns me. And it's not because I think Trump is stupid. I really don't. Not given the way he's built his organization, his media savvy, his branding. No, I think he's quite smart, but I think he is a man that is completely unwilling to engage with facts. I think that you know Obama didn't have any real experience in foreign policy, for example, but he wanted to be the smartest one in the room. He read everything he could, and he brought experts in that he listened to. Didn't always make the right decision, but that's the way he engaged. President Trump doesn't do that. He believes his gut is always right, that he's in full command of the facts even when he's not. He won't listen to experts unless they already agree with him. I think that's a big problem with someone who runs the country. It's compounded by the fact that Trump is unwilling and incapable to actually control his emotional impulses. The single greatest damage that Trump has probably done to himself and his administration was his decision to fire former FBI director James Comey. I am almost certain that felt awesome emotionally when Trump gave it to him and said, that's it, I'm firing this guy. But a day later, it's pretty obvious that not only did it undermine the legitimacy of the FBI, something you shouldn't want to do, but more importantly, that it really caused problems for Trump himself, his entire administration. And going forward, if you ask me where the Mueller investigation is likely to go, how much damage it'll do to Trump and to the country, as well as the possibility for geopolitical um, incidents to suddenly become crises, it is the incompetence of the president that I feel is the greatest danger. That's the thing I'd be spending the most attention on. This week I sit down with Jared Cohen, founder of Google's tech incubator Jigsaw and a veteran foreign policy advisor. I'll talk with him about technology and global politics, including the role of trolls and cybersecurity leading up to this fall's US midterms. Let's get to it. Jared Cohen, CEO of Jigsaw. Let me start with asking you about cyber, and particularly elections. You don't believe that there is a significant cyber threat to midterms coming up in November here in the United States. Why? I believe there's a threat to the midterms. I just believe that in the aftermath of the 2016 election meddling, I believe that foreign adversaries are toning it down. It's probably the smart strategic decision for them. Right? If you don't do as robust a meddling in the midterm elections as you did in the 2016 elections, two things happen. One, um, people are less prepared uh, next time around. Two, it's not as much part of the zeitgeist. Uh, three, people become complacent and feel like they've largely got it under control. Then when it ramps up again, you know, come the 2020 election, um, you know, people are either flat-footed or they're not prepared for it. Is that a theory or do you have some analytic data that suggests that that is really the case thus far as we're moving into the election cycle? Well, there's certainly uh, evidence of disinformation deployments uh, in the context of the midterms. I just, my, my theory, and it is informed by, by you know, both qualitative and quantitative analysis, is that it's not at the scale that we saw in 2016. Um, it's not at the scale that we saw in Russia's own presidential election, and it's not at the scale uh, that we've seen in some of the European elections. So if we were to look at all the elections that have really been hit, as well as the British referendum on Brexit, where would you say um, external actors, in terms of both hacking and disinformation campaigns, rank them? Where, where they had the most impact, where they've been most damaging? It depends how you define damage, right? So what's interesting about disinformation campaigns is it's very difficult to measure how effective they are in terms of changing people's behavior. Mm -hmm. It may be that some of the greatest impact of disinformation campaigns is the sort of the hysteria and the response 
um, that it creates. And we have to be very careful not to conflate attempts at disinformation with success yep. of disinformation. And I think as a society, we are sort of dangerously rounding up and handing adversaries a victory that maybe they didn't achieve. They certainly have meddled, they certainly have attempted, but we have to stop just shy of being able to say in any definitive way that this is what they accomplished. Um, they have fomented a tremendous amount of chaos in the process. Um, they have exacerbated tensions in the process. They have disseminated secrets you know, by you know, hacking people's accounts and then creating fake accounts to disseminate those secrets throughout the world. So there, there's real evidence of where they're playing. It's just very, very difficult to measure. So we get beyond the diagnosing, um, where, at least for now, the challenges seem to be pretty big. What do you think the responses should look like? If you were advising the U.S. government, the European governments right now, knowing that after this midterm, you know, sort of not doing so much, we're going to face a lot of big challenges in other countries, other actors messing with our political legitimacy. We clearly didn't handle it well in 2016. The Brits clearly didn't handle it well with the Brexit referendum. What should we do concretely? Yeah. So Ukraine is having its presidential elections in March of 2019. Mm -hmm. Europe is having its parliamentary elections in May of 2019. And obviously, the US is having its presidential elections 2020, yeah. in 2020. So um, if you subscribe to my theory that it's been toned down, it's still active in our midterm elections, but it's toned down, regardless of the reason, um, we need to recognize that if we're going to get hit in 2020, it's going to be with 2019 and 2020 tools, not 2016 tools. So I believe that, in fact, the best way to protect the European parliamentary election and the U.S. presidential election is to double down on protecting the Ukrainian mm -hmm. presidential election. One, we all want to help Ukraine protect the integrity uh, of their process. It's the right thing to do, um, and it's a stated policy of you know, most Western democracies. Um, but two, there's nothing that the Russians, for example, example, would hit the Americans or the Europeans with that they wouldn't hit the Ukrainians. They wouldn't with. test you. It is the sort of the penultimate um, example, or the sort of the most active example of a target practice. So there's a bunch of tools that are already deployed to protect elections. Those can be deployed to help protect the Ukrainian elections, test the resilience. There's a huge intelligence benefit of just seeing what the latest and greatest tactics are that are being deployed in the context of Ukraine, how state actors work with disinformation entrepreneurs to do this, how they're sort of active in purchasing capabilities on the dark web. You can begin to ask questions. Will we see distortion of video in Ukraine? I, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe, maybe no, or will it still be largely around distortion of imagery? Um, but what's interesting is you also have a very active, as I mentioned before, set of entrepreneurs and civil society in Ukraine. In New York, you know, everyone works on fintech. In Ukraine, they all work on disinformation, counter disinformation, and that's what they're building their companies around. My guess is some of them are pretty good. Um, um, and so there's an opportunity also to build um, not just a robust civil society, but a robust kind of tech ecosystem around fighting disinformation in the world's most active theater. So then the final question would be, okay, you've done your best to defend, these attacks are coming. After such attacks, how do you think the international community or individual governments should respond? It's going to constantly be a game of cat and mouse with various adversaries. So I think it's, it's, we need to find ways to continue to seek out the places that are the most active theaters. But is this like a NATO to... thing? Is this a... Well, so actually, so here, here's a couple of concrete examples, right? So, you know, since you mentioned, since you mentioned NATO, um, you know, what I find very interesting about NATO is it's a security architecture built um, around geography, which makes sense when the world was purely physical. Um, and we're now, you know, having these sort of, you know, growing conversations about NATO expansion and NATO is, you know, you know, become a, a heightened topic again for all the reasons, uh, all the reasons we understand it. There should be a real conversation about whether, you know, we should expand NATO to some of the countries that have the greatest cyber capability, but aren't, you know, geographically located in a place that has historically made sense uh, for NATO. Because honestly, the, the, the greatest threat to NATO countries is probably cyber, not physical at this point. I think the physical deterrents are, um, are, are, are pretty strong. I'm not saying there's no, no threat, but, but, but the, cyber, you know, the cyber attacks are gonna happen on a daily basis and they're gonna keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, I also think that there needs to be serious thinking around what a cyber attack would have to look like in terms of economic damage, potential loss of life, loss of livelihood to trigger an Article 5 
response. The component of the NATO treaty that compels collective self-defense. And this gets to what I think is the greatest vulnerability geopolitically right now in terms of things that we haven't quite gotten our head around, mm -hmm. which is there are no rules of engagement um, that govern how states respond to each other when attacked. There are no doctrines of proportionate response. There's no taxonomy um, around types of attacks or types of targets. We can't even get as simple as what are the list of targets that have attacked could lead to loss of human life. That might actually even be a conversation you could have with, with you know, between frenemies. The other thing that you've spent a lot of your career on uh, is dealing with assessing, understanding terrorism. And we're not talking as much about terrorism these days, right? I mean, we've destroyed ISIS. Um, what do you think we're missing? We need to start thinking now about what a successor to ISIS looks like in terms of its cyber capabilities. So my view is what the sort of successor terrorist organization will do, will be able to do everything that ISIS did, you know, which is you know, you know, using sort of information and disinformation to recruit and to propagate, um, you know, finding ways to coordinate logistics and so forth. Um, but you know, one of the hallmarks of how ISIS built up its capabilities was robbing banks, you know, physically robbing banks, right? So, you know, in Mosul, for example. Yeah, in, in, in Mosul, in I think Iraq, they got like yeah. a billion dollars, right? I mean, Almost, yeah. So, um, so I suspect that a future terrorist organization will build up their economic resilience um, through partnerships with various online criminal groups. It's much easier to to to, to you know uh, criminally generate money uh, on the digital front than it is. Um, you know, by simply robbing banks, there just aren't enough. There just aren't enough banks. We'll also see um, the uh, much more active use of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see coordinated cyber and physical attacks. So a cyber attack that makes it easier to carry out a physical attack. Example of that? You could imagine a cyber attack on you know uh, an electrical grid um, that you know causes a, a temporary blackout, and then a bunch of people come in with suitcases and and so forth. You know, it's sort of like hurricane. Sandy, but not by a natural disaster. Yep. I also think that the type of you know, what we typically think of as propaganda, again, the same, the same things that we see being used in our election are likely to be used by a future terrorist organization as well. The deployment of actual digital people as a much more active way of, of recruiting. Now, it's interesting because all of those things are, are concerning and growing threats, but they're all indirect. And the one thing you didn't mention is you know the likelihood that terrorists are going to directly use cyber capabilities to break things. Mm -hmm. In other words, the terrorist attack itself would be the cyber attack that poisons the water or destroys the nuclear facility or, or whatnot. Is that because you just don't think they are close to having that level of sophistication? So I do worry about it, don't get, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, and I do believe that at some point we're gonna see some kind of an attack um, that you know has significant damage. It's so hard to know where it will come from, what target it will hit. That I find the sort of the fear mongering around it not necessarily to be the most productive um, way to engage in that debate. Whereas I think that you know drawing people's attention to the fact that um, when we see a, if we see a state sponsored cyber attack or a criminal cyber attack that does something like causes a blackout or some kind of chaos that we should next be looking for a physical attack. When you deal about with, with physical terrorism in the United States, obviously there's been that kind of significant big reaction. Right. And yet, you seriously harden your air facilities. You don't with buses or with trains. Right. Um, some could argue that doesn't make a lot of sense, costs right. a lot of money economically. Is there an equivalent, either mistake or lack of appropriate focus in the cyber domain thinking about this? For some reason in government, um, we keep wanting to create cyber this and cyber that. Um, the problem with that is we need to get to a point where we actually just stop talking about cyber, right? When we talk about you know war, you know we don't have conversations about tanks, planes, and boats, and we, we sort of do in a, in a nuanced way. But this is just you know a theater is multidimensional. A theater of, com of conflict is multidimensional. It's physical and it's digital. The capabilities are both physical and digital. We don't talk about our adversaries this way anymore, right? There's no such thing as a cyber terrorist. There's just terrorists and they have physical and cyber capabilities, same thing with criminals. So government has to find a way to figure out how to integrate cyber into everything that it does as opposed to having these sort of you know, orphaned apparatuses um, that are sort of tasked with, with doing cyber. How do you think the world changes most 
as humans become more virtual? Well, I think let's start with humans, right? So the citizen of the future, um, you know, is increasingly splitting their time between, you know, physical and digital domains. They're proliferating versions of themselves. So Ian Bremmer, you know, has multiple email accounts, multiple social networking profiles, multiple phone numbers. And, and you know, a puppet. And a puppet. Mm -hmm. um, you basically have a virtual entourage of yourself walking around, and that virtual entourage has multiple personalities. So you are many, you're basically, you know, able to punch way above your weight as a physical citizen. Um, by, by sort of proliferating yourself. So the global demographics change a lot in that sense. And, you know, a country like Iran that's 80 million people online looks more like a billion people. Um, so that creates a sort of uh, an interesting tension for governments that run the risk of, you know, miscalculating by overreacting or underreacting to things that they see online. Um, the second thing is the first attack on any society is going to be an attack on the conversation. Um, and so the com what we see playing out on the conversation, whether, it whether it's just people being mean or it takes a political, ethnic, or sectarian tone, um, is going to be the first indicator of what happens, uh, of, of what might spill into the street. Now, on the one hand, it's good that there's something that happens before it goes into the street, and we're not just going from zero to machetes in the street. The, the bad news is the barriers of entry to virtually venting or being obnoxious or are zero. much lower, yeah. so it could also accelerate it. The good news is anything that's written down can be measured, and this is one area where machine learning can be quite helpful. Um, you know, for instance, you can, you know, you know, right here at Jigsaw, we've, we've trained um, machine learning models to measure toxicity um, in language on a score of zero to 100. So we can look at any, we can feed any comments or language to these models and tell you how likely that comment is to be perceived as toxic and return that score to whoever is moderating the the, the platform. So there are some interesting technical things that can be done to try to, you know, restore civility uh, to, to the internet. But I think the biggest thing that's gonna gonna change is, is also just the mass proliferation of data. You know, we spent the last decade talking about what happens when societies come online. Now uh, technology is completely ubiquitous, and what that means is a society can't function without having both physical and digital stability. Um, I think governments understand what physical instability looks like and how to deal with it. Um, it's not fair, nor is it going to work to rely entirely on governments to deal with the digital stability problem. So Black Mirror or Ready Player One, which are we, if you had to choose, which are we more heading towards? Uh, Black Mirror really freaks me out. Um, so just by default, I'm going to go to Ready Player One. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Jared Cohen, good to talk to you. All right. Thanks, Ian. And now I've got your puppet regime. It could be anything. Ian Bremmer here with the President of the United States, Mr. Donald J. Trump. Mr. Trump, you are probably the most outspoken president in American history. But is there anything that you feel that you don't get the chance to talk about as much as you'd like? Well, as you know, Ian, I care deeply about children, beautiful, beautiful children, and about education. You may recall my IQ battle with Rex Tillerson, which, of course, I won. And so I wrote a song, actually, to help kids learn the most important parts of the alphabet. I, I brought this guitar. Do you mind? May I? Do you mind? Wow. Well, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, a first on, on G Zero World, a musical interlude from the President of the United States. Is for the great, great anger that everyone's talking about. B's a beautiful border wall to keep the brown kids out. C is for the Chinese breaking all the rules. D boss is gonna defund all of your little schools. E is for the experts who predicted that I'd lose. F I'd put right next to you, but let's just call it fake news. G is great, H is healthcare, which I swear we're gonna get rid of. But in the end, what's the only letter that I never get sick of? It's I, the greatest you'll ever see. I, a letter invented by me. I, the point of ABC. What other letters do you really need? I, 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 I. Estoy hablando español. No, my friend, nice try. I'm just saying I, 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 I,
but Donald, this song is just about you. No, no, no. You comes later. Don't you be such a hater. This is the ABC of me. That's our show this week. We'll be right back here next week with Kevin Rudd, president of the Asia Society's Policy Institute and former prime minister of Australia, a country you have heard about. Don't miss it. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, check us out on g0media.com.